Welcome to the CFA Level 1 presentation on Understanding the Balance Sheet. In this presentation, we will first provide an overview where we will talk about components and format of the balance sheet. We will then talk about current versus non-current assets and liabilities, measurement basis, footnotes. Then we will talk about different kinds of assets, current and non-current as well as dealing with financial assets. We'll then move on to liabilities and equity. After a brief overview of different kinds of liabilities, we will talk about different types of equity and specifically we will cover exactly what minority interest means and other comprehensive income means in the context of equity. This presentation will be concluded with an overview of ratio analysis using the balance sheet. The balance sheet discloses what an entity owns and owes at a specific point in time. It is also referred to as the statement of financial position. The financial position of an entity is described in terms of assets, liabilities and equity. So this statement over here at a specific point in time can be contrasted with the income statement. So as you just saw in the previous lecture, income statement will tell you the picture of a company over a given period such as the year 2010 and the balance sheet will be a snapshot on a particular day such as 31st December 2010. So the balance sheet will tell you what the assets are on that day, what the liabilities are and, and what the equity is on this day. So balance sheet is like a snapshot. The components of the balance sheet, assets, liabilities and equity. So assets are resources controlled by the company as a result of past events and from which economic benefits are expected to flow to the entity. So anything from which the company expects some benefit in the future is called an asset and typical assets on a balance sheet would be cash and cash equivalents, inventory, trade and other receivables. Sometimes you see this referred to as accounts receivable, prepaid expenses, financial assets, property plant and equipment, investment property, intangible assets, assets held for sale and we will be talking about these in a lot more detail during this course. Liabilities represent obligations of a company arising from past events, the settlements of which are expected to result in an outflow of economic benefits from the entity. So essentially any obligations, any future obligations are written as liabilities. Typical liabilities disclosed on the balance sheet are bank borrowings, notes payable, trade and other payables, provisions, unearned revenues, financial liabilities, accrued liabilities and deferred tax liabilities. Here again don't worry if you don't understand terms like deferred tax liabilities and so on. We will see these in detail later. Equity is determined by subtracting the liabilities from the assets of a company, commonly known as shareholders equity or owners equity. So equity basically is the total assets of the firm minus the liabilities gives us equity. You'll notice throughout this reading that, uh, or actually throughout this topic on financial reporting and analysis, that there's a lot of detail on defining assets. There is detail on defining liabilities in terms of how to measure them and so on. Equity then is simply the difference between the two. So there is not too much detail on measuring equity because equity is just what remains when we do assets minus liabilities. The format of the balance sheet. The balance sheet should distinguish between major categories of assets and liabilities, two common formats, a report format and an account format. In a report format, all the components, the different kinds of assets and then liabilities are listed in a single column. So you will have all your assets and then liabilities and then equity. 
in an account format this is more traditional we basically follow a uh, general ledger accounts with assets on the left and liabilities and equities at the right of a central dividing line so many of us have seen this assets on the left liabilities and equity on the right a classified balance sheet groups together similar items to arrive at significant subtotal so for example you might have cash inventory accounts receivable all these are grouped together and a subtotal for current assets then property plant and equipment all the property plant and equipment are summed together and we have a subtotal and so on so this would be a classified yeah. balance sheet current assets are assets which can be converted into cash or used up in one year or one operating cycle an operating cycle could be longer than a year for a airplane manufacturer for example and what we mean by an operating cycle is the time from which we buy raw material to the time that we collect cash or till the time that we sell so this is our operating cycle current liabilities are obligations which will be settled in one year or one operating cycle excess of current assets over current liabilities is called working capital so working capital is simply our current assets minus current liabilities high working capital means that we have a lot of current assets a lot of money tied up in our current assets relative to our immediate obligations and this would imply an inefficient use of funds low working capital would mean potential liquidity problems now high how high is high and how low is low really depends on the industry you are operating in and to determine whether a given company has high working capital we need to compare the working capital with other firms in the same industry more on this later non current assets are assets which are not converted into cash or used up within one year or one operating cycle non current liabilities are obligations which are not settled in one year or one operating cycle ifrs uh, ifrs requires non current slash current format unless a liquidity based presentation is more relevant the exception applies all assets and liabilities shall be presented broadly in order of liquidity so this means that whenever we present a balance sheet the typical way of presenting it is to show our current assets versus Uh, fixed or long term assets separately and then current liabilities and long term liabilities separately so in general this is what's required the exception is for say the banking industry for a bank rather than showing assets and liabilities in terms of current versus non current it makes more sense to simply show the assets and liabilities in terms of liquidity where you can start with the most liquid and go down to the most illiquid or the other way around but basically organize your assets and liabilities by liquidity measurement basis balance sheet contains a mixture of fair value costs and historical costs with fair value the amount at which an asset can be bought or sold or a liability can be settled so a classic example would be land let's say that you bought land 10 years ago for 1 million dollars and the market value of that now is 4 million so the question is should you show land at the historical cost of 1 million or the current fair value of 4 million if you were to buy that land or sell that land today it would go for 4 million so 
if we say that land is being shown on the balance sheet at fair value it means that we are showing land at 4 million if we say that the asset is being shown at historical cost then that implies that we are showing it at the cost at which it was purchased so historical cost is the value that was exchanged at the acquisition date in limited circumstances current costs and present value are also used where current cost is the cost to replace an asset and present value represents the discounted value of future cash flows so as mentioned this is in limited circumstances the two main types of measurement bases that you need to be aware of are fair value and historical cost as we study assets and liabilities in more detail through this uh, entire topic we will define which whether an asset needs to be shown on fair value or historical cost notes to financial statements are integral parts of both us gap and ifrs reporting now rather than reading through this i'll just uh, let you know that whenever you look at say a balance sheet in the balance sheet you will see assets such as inventory property plant and equipment and so on so in your balance sheet there will simply be a number associated with assets such as inventory property plant and equipment as well as uh, your liabilities such as short term debt and so on but associated with each item there will be a footnote and these footnotes provide a lot of detail on this number so if inventory is 100 this footnote will give details on that inventory as well as whether inventory is being measured on a first in first out basis last in first out basis we'll see this information in more detail later but the core point is that the details associated with items on the balance sheet are shown in the footnotes and hence for an analyst to truly understand the financial picture of a company it is absolutely essential to study the footnotes in a lot of detail current assets we've already talked about but what are the typical current assets the typical current assets are shown on the slide and they are cash and cash equivalents marketable securities so these might be financial assets such as stocks bonds etc accounts receivable inventories and other current assets such as prepaid expenses and so on but these four types of current assets you need to be very very familiar with inventory which so what we are going to talk about now is some of the major current assets so one current asset is inventory inventory is measured at lower of cost or net realizable value what this means is let's say that you bought inventory for dollars 10 and then let's say that the value of the inventory in the market went up so the net realizable value is how much you could sell the inventory for let's say you can sell it for 15 minus the cost to make that sale possible let's say that's dollar 1 so the net realizable value will be 14 on your balance sheet inventory needs to be shown at 10 dollars because that is the lower of cost or net realizable value cost is 10 net realizable value is 14 so you need to show it for show the inventory on your balance sheet at $10 now let's say that for some reason the market price or the amount at which you can sell this comes down to dollars 9 the cost to sell is still 1 so the net realizable value is now 8 if this is the case then now on your balance sheet you have to show inventory at 8 so that's what this statement means alternative techniques can only be used if resulting valuation approximates cost so some organizations use a method called standard costing where we assign a predetermined cost to goods produced or a retail method where we 
simply say cost is equal to the retail selling price minus some standardized gross margin so as mentioned this technique can only be used of these potential techniques can only be used if resulting valuation approximates the actual cost there is a whole reading on inventory later on so we will study this in more detail later tangible assets are long term assets with physical substance and are hence called tangible assets sometimes these are also called fixed assets they are reported in the balance sheet at historical cost less accumulated depreciation so historical cost is the original cost that you paid for let's say a given piece of equipment and all cost necessary to get the asset ready for use so if you paid 10 million for a large piece of equipment and another 1 million to install it and set it up this will be shown on your balance sheet initially at 11 million and then every year you depreciate let's say that this asset will last 11 years and will have zero value at the end of 11 years you will depreciate 1 million every year assuming the straight line method we'll talk about depreciation and fixed assets again in a lot more detail later but just to give you an idea at the end of year 1 if we've depreciated 1 million then we will show the asset the book value of the asset will be 10 million 2 years later the book value of the asset will be further reduced by 1 million down to 9 million and so on land typically is not depreciated because it is classified as an investment asset intangible assets are acquired singly and rights or privileges have finite benefit periods so with intangible assets we have two types identifiable and unidentifiable identifiable assets are acquired singly and rights or privileges have finite benefit period so what exactly does this mean when you acquire a new patent or a copyright or a trademark you might pay say 5 million for a new patent and this might be valid for 5 years so you clearly identify that you are buying xyz patent you know how much you are paying for it and that patent has a certain useful life so this would be an example of a identifiable intangible asset these assets are amortized over the useful life amortization is exactly like depreciation except it is applied to intangible assets if you are amortizing 1 million every year then after 1 million this asset will be worth 4 million after 2 years it will be worth 3 million and so on so with unidentifiable assets the asset is not acquired singly and the rights benefits would not have a finite period a classic example is goodwill so when you buy a company goodwill is the excess of purchase price over the fair value of identifiable assets and liabilities so if the fair value of identifiable assets and liabilities is 10 million and you pay 12 million for a business then the goodwill is 12 million minus 10 million which is 2 million now notice that the 2 million worth of goodwill you cannot buy separately so to get that goodwill you need to pay the entire 12 million for the business and since it's not identifiable it cannot be amortized however periodically and this would be at least a year you need to test for impairment you need to check whether that extra 2 million that you paid for goodwill whether that still holds and this will be covered in detail when we do the reading on long lived assets for intangible assets that are purchased we use historical cost less amortization for intangible assets that are developed internally so you for example develop a 
patent internally the legal costs can be capitalized so let's say you spend 1 million on legal fees so that is the fee given to lawyers the fee for registration etc to register this patent that can be shown as an asset according to us gap all other expenses uh, related to this pact have to be expensed so if you spend three million dollars on this patent other than the legal fee this three million has to be shown as a expense in the income statement for the year where this patent was being developed uh, was being developed according to IFRS any research the research related work that you do for this patent can be or should be expensed whereas development costs so actually building prototypes related to this patent or development work this can be capitalized again more detail on this later under both US cap and IFRS some expenses must be expensed when we say expensed over here again this will this distinction between expensing and capitalizing we will see in detail later but very briefly by expense we mean we show it in the income statement for a given year so any training costs startup costs administrative costs advertising relocation etc so all these costs must be expensed which means they must be shown in the shown as expenses in the income statement financial instruments financial instruments are found both on asset and liability side of the balance sheet when we talk about a financial asset this includes investment securities such as stocks and bonds derivatives loans receivables etc financial liabilities include derivatives notes payable bonds payable Derivatives, which we will talk about in detail when we cover derivatives, are, instrument whose, are instruments whose values are based on some underlying factor. And just understand this terminology for now. Mark to market is the process whereby the value of most trading assets and liabilities are adjusted to current fair value. So let's say that you bought a stock for $10 and today that stock trades at $11. So on your balance sheet that asset needs to be shown at $11 and this process of showing the price which is or showing a value equal to current market price is called marking to market or mark to market. Market marketable investment securities are classified as either held to maturity trading securities and available for sale this is important and essentially what this means is say you buy a a corporate bond that bond would either be classified as held to maturity trading or available for sale how you classify depends on your intention if you buy a security such as a bond where you intend to hold the bond till maturity then you will classify this as held to maturity or HTM if you plan to sell this when the price is right so you are simply waiting for interest rates to go down so the price of the bond goes up and then you plan to sell it or if you own shares which you will sell when the market goes up then these would classify as trading security and if you are not sure or you you don't plan to trade immediately but you plan to sell at some point before the security reaches maturity then classify it as available for sale or AFS now how do we deal with these securities on the balance sheet and income statement as already mentioned there are three possible classifications so let's say that you buy a bond and if the bond is classified as a trading security then on the balance sheet it must be shown at 
fair value. So if you bought the bond for 100 and it's now trading at 95, on the balance sheet you need to show it at 95. Any dividends, in this case, since it's a bond, you will be receiving interest. Had you purchased a stock, then you would be recording dividends. But let's say that this is a 5% bond, which means you get $5 every year. So those that $5 needs to be shown on the income statement as interest income. You need to show any realized as well as unrealized gains and losses. So in this case, let's say that the price went down, but you did not sell the bond yet. So $5 is unrealized gain. Unrealized gains and losses are the gains and losses that happen where which have not been realized. So this means that you've not sold the bond. Had you sold the bond, then the loss in this case would have been realized. The point being that for trading securities, even unrealized gains and losses are shown on the income statement. For trading securities, this other comprehensive income is not applicable. Had you classified the bond as available for sale, then on the balance sheet you would still show it at fair value. So in my example, you would show the bond at 95. Income, so the interest of $5 would be shown. And now here is the difference between AFS and trading. You only show realized gains and losses on the income statement. In this case, since we have not sold the bond, we did not have any realized loss. So there will be nothing over here. However, the unrealized gains and losses, which in our case is minus five, will be shown under other comprehensive income. Now the third category is held to maturity. Here on the balance sheet, you show your bond at amortized cost. We will understand this concept of amortized cost later when we, when we deal with bonds and when we deal with uh, fixed income securities. But for now, let's just say that this is approximately equal to historical cost. Say you bought the bond for 100, then with this held to maturity classification, the bond will be shown at 100 on your balance sheet. On the income statement, we show the interest and any realized gains and losses. Interest was $5. There is no realized gain or loss because we've not sold the bond. And that is it. Since we are planning to hold the bond to maturity, we do not record any unrealized gains and losses. Let's do this problem now. IFT Corporation purchases a 10% bond for dollars 100,000 at the beginning of the year. Interest rates have recently increased and the market value of the bond has declined by $2,000. What is the impact on the financial statements under each classification? What I want you to do now is pause the video and fill in this table. Okay, welcome back. So if this is a trading security, this is the first classification. What do you do? On the balance sheet recall, we need to show this at fair value. The bond was purchased for hundred thousand the value has gone down by two thousand so on the balance sheet you need to show ninety eight thousand on the income statement for a trading security the first thing that we show is the interest income ten percent of hundred thousand would be ten thousand plus since this is a trading security we also need to show unrealized gains and losses in this case, we have an unrealized loss of 2000 So overall, we have an impact of 8000 on the income statement. Other comprehensive income is not applicable over here. Had this bond been classified as available for sale or AFS, then again on the balance sheet, we need to show this at fair value which would be 98,000. 
on the income statement remember we show the interest which is 10,000 we do not show unrealized gains and losses on the income statement so overall impact on the income statement is to show an income of 10,000 however that unrealized loss of 2,000 is shown on shown under other comprehensive income had this bond been classified as held to maturity on the balance sheet we show the historical cost which is 100,000 on the income statement we show our interest income which is 10,000 and since we plan to hold this till maturity we show nothing we do not even mention the unrealized loss. Liability.